Thank you. It's nice to be here. All right. Um, so I get to argue for the role of adjuvant chemotherapy in stage 1B, uh, but Dr. Govindan was nice enough to give me the sometimes as opposed to always, and that's usually an easier position to argue. Um, so I wanted to uh, start by reminding you that, of course, there's been a change in the staging, and most of the adjuvant trials are actually done with the AJCC 6th edition, and therefore, we're looking at data for a lot of stage 1 tumors that now would be considered stage 2, those without nodal involvement but larger tumors, and so I think we need to keep that in mind, and it does, does play a role, but there still are tumors that are in the stage 1 category um, in that 3 to 5 centimeter range where there probably is a role for adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy, and that's what I'm going to argue. This slide shows that for these tumors, as you get larger, the likelihood of recurrence goes higher and the five-year survival rates drop. So you can see in this slide that uh, you know, patients whose tumors in the three to five centimeter range, you're still looking at only about a 50% survival rate um, at five years. That's not very good. We'd like to be able to do something to change that. This is data you've seen in a slightly different format already from Dr. Ramalingan. These are the, uh, me, uh, the adjuvant trials that were initiated after the 1995 meta-analysis, which showed potential benefit from the use of adjuvant chemotherapy. And you can see here that not all of the trials were positive, but many of them were. And the largest cisplatin-based studies have all shown a survival benefit at five years. Now, this argument is not about adjuvant chemotherapy in general, it's really about the 1B subset, and so we'll go into more detail on that. Um, first, though, I want to show you again this data from the LACE meta-analysis, which pooled the five largest cisplatin-based trials and put them together to try to get a sense of what's the truth. And in these studies, the overall survival hazard ratio was 0.89, not as great as we'd like it to be, but something and statistically significant. If you look at by stage, none of the studies showed a clear benefit for stage 1A, but these studies, for the most part, didn't include very many stage 1A patients, so that's an underpowered analysis. The stage 1B did not reach statistical significance, but it did show potential benefit, hazard ratio of 0.93, and it was in the stage 2s and 3s, of course, that we saw the most substantial benefit. Now, we're not including in our discussions anything other than the sort of North, Ameri North American and European studies that looked at cisplatin-based treatment. I think we do need to bring in that in Asia there's a different approach, and that's with the oral 5-FU derivatives. There's a tremendous body of work with UFT, which is ur uracil tigafor, um, and there, the hazard ratio for the stage 1 patients, looking at over 2,000 patients from a pooled meta-analysis, that hazard ratio was 0.74, highly statistically significant much better than any of these numbers. And in Japan, um, and I'm going to look at Dr. Suboy over here, um, it's absolutely the standard of care to offer oral UFT to any patients with stage 1B tumors. And it's, we're debating the, the stage 1Bs here. They actually looked at tumors over 2 centimeters. Anything over 2 centimeters, they felt that there was benefit, and they have data to support that. They're now moving on from the UFT and looking at S1, which is another oral 5-FU derivative. So I haven't put those slides in, but I think it's important to mention as we look at a global perspective that there's very strong data for treating with adjuvant chemotherapy, but not with the cisplatin-based regimens that we're discussing today and, and that we use in this country. All right, so now moving into the stage 1B data a little bit more. So the CLGB9633 was the only North American trial that's focused only in the 1B patient population. Um, and there are a lot of things we can talk about with this study, particularly the fact that this is one of the, the studies where, because it was halted early, we might have been prevented from learning the real truth. So this study was halted when the initial analysis, which was presented in 2004, looked like the study was strongly positive in favor of the adjuvant carboplatin paclitaxel. The hazard ratio then was 0.62, highly statistically significant. However, with longer-term follow-up, those curves well, came together, um, and there was no longer statistical significance, and this is considered a negative trial. However, there is this uh, granted post-doc analysis, which Dr. Ramalingan has already discussed and dismissed, but I don't think we should s dismiss it quite so quickly. Um, because you see here that in the patients with the larger tumors, and they did use a four centimeter cut point, the four centimeters did not show up on the new staging that I was just showing you, uh, it sort of falls right in the middle. 
So they came up with the four centimeters, and here there was a hazard ratio of 0.66. Now think about the LACE meta-analysis. There was nothing near a 0.66 there. So here we have 0.66. It was statistically significant for patients with tumors that were greater than four centimeters. And that was over half of the patients on the trial, so about 100 in each arm here. If you look at those with the smaller tumors, um, the hazard ratio was closer to one. No benefit demonstrated. So that in a vacuum is just one study with a post hoc analysis. However, it's not just one study with a post hoc analysis. There was a second trial that also had a similar result. This is the uh, BR10 study done in Canada with cisplatin and venerelbine. And here the same thing comes out. For the stage 1B patients, and this study was 1Bs and 2s only, but for the 1B patients, here again we see that same hazard ratio of 0.66 which I'll show up on the next slide, for those patients whose tumors were greater than or equal to four centimeters, this is a pretty nice separation of the curves in favor of the adjuvant chemotherapy. For the smaller tumors, you don't see that, and if anything, there's potential for harm, which was not seen in the CLGB trial. So I put this little table together to uh, emphasize, again, that we're getting the same 0.66 hazard ratio in these granted post hoc analyses from both trials. Um, in one reaching statistical significance, not in the other. Um, but for the smaller tumors, no benefit and potential harm on the JBR10 trial. So I wasn't asked to argue that we should always give adjuvant chemotherapy to patients with 1B disease, just sometimes. And as you're thinking about your patients, if a patient comes into you and they have a 4.8 centimeter tumor, you know that if you do nothing further, their likelihood of recurrence is quite high. And perhaps there really is benefit to giving adjuvant chemotherapy. Is it right to deny the patient that opportunity? Okay, so um, whenever I give a talk on adjuvant treatment, I have to show this slide because this is the ECOG 1505 trial, which is still accruing, but we have just over 40 patients to go, so please keep it in mind. Um, and this is the adjuvant trial looking at chemotherapy plus or minus the use of bevacizumab. And the reason I pointed out is that we've decided to use this post hoc analysis, and patients with 1B disease are allowed to enroll in the trial provided their tumor's at least four centimeters in size. And if, um, in data that was presented two years ago, our sort of interim analysis of who's actually going on the trials, it's very interesting to note that about a quarter of the patients who are enrolled onto this trial have stage 1B disease, at least four centimeters in size. And we are using the AJCC6 for this trial because it was developed in that era and about half the patients had enrolled before the switch happened. So we will get more data about the, the role of adjuvant chemotherapy. It won't be a comparison to no treatment, but we'll be able to see outcomes in this group. Okay, now I'm going to very quickly go through this data that uh, Dr. Ramalingan already mentioned, which is just this idea, well, if we can't give this chemotherapy to everybody, it's not helping all. Is there a way to select who might benefit more? We used to hope that the ERCC1 story might be a path towards that selection process, but unfortunately, that no longer seems to be the reality. So this was a post hoc analysis from the IALT study. Um, where they looked at ERCC1 levels with the idea that theoretically if someone had high ERCC1 levels in the tumor, they were going to be resistant to chemotherapy, and if they had low levels, they would be sensitive. And so that's what this initial post hoc analysis seemed to imply. Those with low um, ERCC1 levels, chemotherapy seemed to be beneficial, hazard ratio 0.65, and that actually persisted even in, um, after the follow-up study showed that maybe the overall trial wasn't as positive as we had initially hoped. And then patients with the ERCC1 positive tumors, um, there was no real role for the chemotherapy. So that was the original data that came out. But this year, there was a New England Journal publication from the same group um, that went back and reanalyzed not just their original YALT analysis, but actually several other of the adjuvant trials, looking at ERCC1. And over time, something has changed about the antibody. Um, so they initially looked at about half of the patients. They had data, uh, they had samples left on a smaller number of patients. It was still a pretty substantial number, almost 600 patients. When they initially had looked at ERCC1 positivity, it was about 44 percent uh, when they did the initial analysis. Um, however, when they went back, it's now 77 percent. So for some reason with this new antibody, m much, many, many more of these tumors are staying positive for ERCC1. And with this new analysis, there was no longer a statistically uh, significant difference between the positive and negatives. 
Um, and if you look on the flip side of that, those that are ERCC1 negative, there's now a very small number that were ERCC1 negative. And remember, this is the group that's supposed to benefit from the chemotherapy. Um, and the hazard ratio in the past had been quite good. It's now 0.81, but it's no longer statistically significant. And this has led the French group, who had led this um, ILT analysis, to abandon their use of ERCC1 as a potential marker in treating adjuvant therapy. And that's important because they are running this, they were running this TASTE trial, which is one of four adjuvant trials based on ERCC1 analyses or other markers. Um, so this trial has been halted. They were show, able to show feasibility, um, but they're not moving forward into the um, next phase, as uh, Dr. Romalingan mentioned. This study was completed, uh, the Southwest Oncology Group trial. Um, it's not clear that they're going to move forward. This trial in Italy is still progressing, but obviously with a lot of questions about the validity of the ERCC1 at this time. And then uh, the Spanish group didn't base their work on ERCC1, but they also presented at ASCO this year. And in the metastatic setting, these markers that they are using in adjuvant were not helpful in selecting patients. So I, I think that our, our hopes that have been going on for many years that we'll be able to better select patients by these markers for who should get adjuvant chemotherapy kind of been dashed this year. Okay, so then very briefly on which chemotherapy to use. That wasn't what I was asked to debate, but I think it's always an important topic. Um, so obviously our strongest data in adjuvant is with cisplatin and venerelbine, but we have some data for using other cisplatin-based doublets. Cisplatin and venerelbine, of course, is a relatively toxic combination. So in 2011 at ASCO, a group of German investigators presented this TREAT trial where they directly compared cisplatin venerelbine with cisplatin pemetrexid, and they showed that they had better drug delivery with the cisplatin pemetrexid and better tolerability. They weren't able to show efficacy, but this study had a lot of early stage patients. It also had a lot of squamous patients because it was designed before we knew about the pemetrexid squamous uh, not good fit. So it, we won't really have data there. The NCCN guidelines in the United States, of course, have multiple cisplatin venerelbine options based on what was in the trials. But they also include three other drugs as possibilities, gemcitabine, docetaxel, or pemetrexid. So these are all in the guidelines, despite the lack of data. And getting back to ECOG 1505, my favorite slide, um, you can see that we actually allow for patients to get cisplatin venerelbine or cisplatin docetaxel or cisplatin gemcitabine or cisplatin pemetrexid, sort of the, the drug combinations that are approved as first-line options um, for metastatic disease. We brought all of those in as adjuvant possibilities. And actually, um, people are enrolling on to all of the different chemotherapy options a little bit lower in the pemetrexid um, because this study, adjuvant trial, allows for squamous patients and of course they're not allowed to get pemetrexid, so we have lower numbers there. It was also added on later. Okay, so um, I had put this in, I'm gonna skip it because you've already heard a very nice debate on this topic. Um, actually, backing up. I do just want to again point out that in the BR19 trial, for all of its flaws, they did go back and look at the patients with EGFR mutations. Um, and if anything, the separation of the curves where the placebo is looking better than the gefitinib is more striking in those patients with EGFR mutations on this flawed trial where patients got a very short time period of drug, where it was stopped early and all the caveats. But this is certainly a, a harmful signal. Okay, so that's all he's going to say about that. So, in conclusion, adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy is the standard of care in North America for patients with resected stage 2 and 3A non-small cell lung cancer. Patients with larger stage 1 tumors likely benefit. Adjuvant chemotherapy is sometimes indicated for stage 1B, and again to reiterate that in other countries in Asia, especially in Japan, oral UFT um, and now oral S1 being investigated, these are absolutely considered standard of care for patients with resected 1B disease. ERCC1 is not a useful marker. Cisplatin venerelbine is standard, but there are other platinum doublets that we can be considering as substitutions. And there's ongoing research for targeted therapy. And please continue to enroll to 1505. We've got 42 to go. Thanks. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, Ram, any quick uh, rebuttal?